Mr. Gaines, Mr. Gaines, Chris Gaines. Hi, Rose. We have known each other for a very long time. And long before we were GMB trainers, uh, long before you owned your own gym, long before either one of us thought about online training, uh, we've, we've known true. each other. You're one of the first people I met when I moved to California. So I'm, uh, I'm pretty excited to get to talk to you about your work today since it's evolved quite a bit since I met you. Um, yeah. So for those of you who don't know Chris Gaines, you need to know Chris Gaines. Uh, he's got a fantastic gym that's very popular in Palo Alto, California. And he does a whole bunch of projects on the side too for his own coaching business. So Chris, when did you start Performance Gains and, and kind of how, how have you gotten to where you are with your online coaching business? Um, well, firstly, thank you for having me, Rose. This is a delight. <laughs> uh, so um, PG officially started in 2009, uh, but the actual like facility that we have now, we, we didn't move in there until 2016. Um, and it's an awesome part? space. It was an awesome, it's an awesome space. If any of you are in Palo Alto, California, you should definitely stop by. Um, the second part of my question was you've always done, I mean, you, you develop performance gains, but then you've also done your own coaching on the side. And that's kind of morphed into, you know, in the past year, more online work that has gone from, you know, virtual remote coaching and, you know, want more one-on-one -on -one based coaching. And now you're branching off into to programming. So I'm kind of interested to hear a little bit more about that evolution. Yeah. Uh, so uh, like you said, I've, I've always, you know, work with clients on, on my own and, you know, when, when the whole lockdown happened, um, you know, my first thought was, you know, let's make sure we take care of PG and we, we, you know, pivoted classes online and things of that sort. And, and with that, I started to just, just, think a lot more about like if, if we can scale classes and make them online why couldn't or shouldn't we be able to do the same thing with one-on-one -on -one coaching um, and so I, I've just been exploring different ways of trying to take the in-person like I, the in-person experience I think is a, a really personal experience um, mm -hmm. and so I've been ex exploring different ways of taking that that experience and bringing it to more people uh, and that's, that's really kind of the foundation of everything I'm trying to do with my online stuff. Like how do I, how do I create more personalized or customized or, um, you know, unique programs that really like meet people where they're at, but do so with people I haven't necessarily met. Um, and that is the, the experiment and the challenge all wrapped <laughs> in one. I was just going to ask, like, how, how have you found, like, what have you found that's working in that approach? Because that, you know, I feel like a lot of trainers, um, when they go online, keep with one-on-one, -on -one. it's most familiar. It's, you know, it does provide that like more personalized approach, but it's not as scalable. So I'm yeah. curious, you know, how you've found like ways to do that, to, to, to reach people, um, in a more individualized, personalized way, but not do one-on-one -on -one coaching. So I'm certainly still learning, but I will share with you what I, you know, what I know up to now. Um, first, it's not easy, um, but but certainly like the the one-on-one -on -one stuff is really important. I think even um, online or Zoom or wherever, or however you're doing it, because I think that at least for what I'm trying to do is. <coughs> the testing ground almost for the scale for like the, the stuff in small groups or at scale. So, um, you know, things that I found that are, that, that don't necessarily translate from one-on-one -on -one to group stuff is like being able to give very, very specific cueing. It's really hard to do if you're pre-recording something. Um, one thing I have been doing is taking more mental notes of, of, you know, what I, what I do need to continually say to people, whether I'm seeing them in per, not in person, but whether I'm seeing them live online or if I'm doing an online class, like what are the cues that continually come up? And I've been playing around, especially more recently with um, doing follow along classes that uh, where in that class, 
I'm thinking about the cues that I'm normally giving people that I might see live, and I'm verbalizing those cues in the follow along. And so far, there's been some pretty good. Um, that's gotten a, a, a decent a decent response. Um, you know, there's there's probably other stuff, but but I won't go I won't go too long on that on that answer. How about that? Okay. Well, we can we can actually circle back to that because I first I want you to to tell people about what you're doing. Like, what are your you've got two programs right now that you're actively running and a third in the works. So can you yeah. tell us a little bit about those? Yes. So the first program, the first online program that I started was uh, Essential Strength. And the purpose of that was like, that's my first initial uh, program to attempt to bring that personalized um, training experience to a group of people online who are living all over the country or the world. Um, so that's Essential Strength. And that is, um, yeah, it's the closest thing I can think of to a, uh, a, a personalized program that you would get from a trainer if you're meeting with them in person that's that's how i think of it um and it's you you charge more for that option because it is so personalized yeah there's there's back and forth interaction you know i'm adjusting programs whether it's weekly or every other week um you know making tweaks based upon you know if someone's traveling things of that sort it's it's a it's a pretty customized program okay um, and then, and then I have something I call ten minutes to better, which actually was born from the essential strength program because uh, one of the things I've been realizing is even though we're not necessarily commuting to work nowadays, um, we're actually spending more time working these days, ironically, and and we also I think have at least in the area that I live in, there's a there's a culture where we we don't necessarily prioritize taking a bunch of time out of the day to go take care of ourselves physically or even mentally for that matter. So um, 10 Minutes to Better is, is a program that's meant to help help people who aren't quite at that point of being comfortable taking a lot of time out of the day or maybe need people who need um, to build more of that, that habit or that consistency of mm -hmm. just doing anything for themselves. Uh, 10 minutes better is meant to help break it down into a 10 minute chunk. So you can just like, all you got to do is start the, uh, the session. And, you know, when you finish after a little bit of jibber jabber from me, uh, it winds up being probably like 11 minutes, but it's, it's a, it's a pretty confined time for you to do the work that you need to do. That's going to help you move and live hopefully a little bit more freely throughout the day. And that one's pre-recorded. Pre-recorded, yeah. Okay, so not as much individualized coaching with that one. Yeah, so that one does not have the individualized coaching. It does have the cueing uh, because the movements in that are things that I've been working with people on in the past. So it does have the cueing, um, just not the same kind of uh, individualized coaching. Right, and this one's follow along too, as opposed to mm -hmm. essential strength is like kind of asynchronistic. You do it on your own. This one is much more like press play and do it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good. That's good to bring that up. So essential strength is more, um, you know, you're you kind of already know certain movements are comfortable with them. You're you're good doing them on your own. And then uh, what I found with ten minutes to better, it's a it's a much more approachable program for people if like you're just not a hundred percent sure that you're you know quote unquote doing something right you know, and it's you know whether there isn't really a right or wrong every movement is fine it's really a matter of whether the outcome of that movement is what you intend it to be mm -hmm. so i so in that follow along i'm cueing you to make sure that the outcome is as intended got it and so you said that 10 minutes better was born out of essential strength can you talk a little bit more because i know you launched essential strength first and then did some experimenting with those groups that you put through essential strength and then came up with 10 minutes to better. So can you talk a little bit about how that happened? Yes. So essential strength, the plan was that it would be a, you know, around 40 to 45 minute program that people would do about three times a week. And, you know, in, you know, follow-up um, sessions, uh, when I'm checking in with people, you know, if they're having difficulty either doing the three sessions in a week 
um, or don't feel like they have enough time to do them all. So they're just doing a portion of them. So over the course of the central strength, different questions would pop up. Like um, if I don't have time, can I just do part of it? And, and, and my answer of course is yes, like do what you can um, because it's gonna help you build uh, your habits and, and consistent uh, consistent routine. Um, but it's also gonna help you, help give you more variability in, in the way you're living your life. So you're not sitting all the time, you're at least doing something. So that was one thing that came up is, you know, being able to break things up into chunks and feel more comfortable with doing that. Um, and then in other cases, you know, I'm thinking of uh, one person in particular who, you know, she was just working really long days. And so, and she would work uh, certain shifts where she'd, she'd work five days in a row like that. Um, and then, you know, to ask her to do 45 minutes on the end of that or at the beginning of that is, is kind of challenging. Mm -hmm. So um, what we wound up doing with her is I made a, a 10 minute routine for her that she could just, she could, you know, she gets home and, you know, she puts something on the stove or, you know, get certain things ready for, for, um, for the next day. And then she goes and does her 10 minutes of work. And what, what, what we found pretty quickly was that she was able to be much more consistent with that, that short time frame. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so that, was something that I then started trying with other people. And it, again, it continued to work. And so 10 minutes to better came out of that. Cool. And, the, and I, I think the thing that I really wanted to touch on with that question, which you kind of, you answered perfectly is that you started off with one idea in mind and tried it a couple of mm -hmm. times and figured out who that worked for, who it didn't work for, really who the fit was for that type of program and then created another idea based off the research and like data you got from from running that so like you you didn't come out with like I've got these two programs and now I'm just going to run them like it was definitely a, like try this see how it goes get the feedback adjust things try it again get the feedback okay make something different yeah lots of iteration I yeah, I think sometimes people think like they need to have the programs finished and like they're going to be perfect before they really get them in front of people. Um, and that's not that's not the case, right? Like it's it's yeah. always a, a, a evolving process. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I remember we were talking about that before, right? And I was like, oh, I gotta get everything written out perfectly. Um, and I, and I, I didn't have everything written out perfectly ahead of time. Um, and it, it's almost better that way because then I could be more adaptable. And then I was even more open to that, uh, that possibility of being able to make an adjustment for one person specifically, but then also realize that that adjustment actually can help many more people. Right. And so talk a little bit about your target audience, like spoiler alert, Chris and I have worked together on some marketing stuff, but one thing that we really worked on for a while was figuring out who your, who your audience is and and how these programs fulfill a need for your audience so yeah. could you talk a little bit about that um so you know what i work with many different types of people but to get a little more specific the people that like essential strength was meant for initially was were busy professionals um mainly parents who again didn't have a ton of time to work out or train and so they wanted to, to to do something for themselves that would help them also kind of you know enjoy playing with their families more and you know have fewer aches and pains uh, and so that's kind of like where i am in terms of who who i work with the most easily i guess because i'm also one of those people so right. these, okay. things, these things work for me as well um right you know, so I've, I've, I've done my own 10 minutes of better. Not only do I record it, I also then listen to myself as I go through it when I, when I need a little 10 minute boost, um, which is kind of ironic and meta, but it's, but it's good nonetheless. <laughs> um, so you, but your target audience is different than who's necessarily walking into performance games. Like, I feel like, um, you know, a, a target audience for a gym is really different than a target audience for a trainer. And so I just wanted to, to kind of point that out a little bit that 
you had to even narrow down more like who you were going to focus on for your personal coaching rather than just like, cause at the gym, you coach kind of anybody, right? Like whoever is walking in the door, you can pitch it and work with kind of any clientele, but for your programs, you really narrowed it down. Yes, exactly. And, um, narrowed, it, narrowed it down be, to that, to that specific group, um, to, because without doing that, I was, I wasn't really able to really figure out all the, you know, the different features of the program that are going to be really beneficial, right. To a specific group. If I, if I make it too general, then it's, um, it's not, it's not going to be compelling enough to really speak to someone. Right. Um, so, yeah. Um, and what has been kind of the most challenging part of figuring out that target audience and like customizing your programs to them? Good question. Um, I have some ideas just because I remember talking to you about this. <laughs> yeah, uh, let's see if I can if I can think through it. So, so in terms of like figure in terms of figuring it out, um, you know, as you know, my head can go many different places. So I think <laughs> uh, you know because I, I want to help everyone. Who doesn't want to help everyone? So it's really like narrowing it down and, and, and thinking about, you know, a, a group of people that, that probably could use a little bit more help and aid. Um, and so to do so, you know, I, I, I literally looked around friends and family and, and was thinking about the different people who, um, for me, seemed like they wanted to do more for themselves in one way, shape or form, but just didn't seem to have uh, the agency or the time or whatever it needed to be for them to actually take that first step towards doing something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also remember conversations with you about like trying to figure out like the style of the program or like the formatting or um, how much explanation goes into something, because I feel like as trainers, there's things that we want to include, we feel are really important, but if it's not going to reach that audience, if that's too much for them, if it's too confusing or, you know, not, if they're not able to connect it to exactly where they're at and what they're doing, they're going to, they're, it's going to be lost on them. So I feel like we had a lot of conversations about that, that it's, you know, it can be hard for us as trainers when we we want all these things for our clients and we want them, we want certain outcomes and we, we, you know, want them to do certain things, but if they're not there yet, how do you, how, can you do those things with them? Probably not. Right. I feel like we went back and forth on that a lot because you would want to include something that might make it longer than 10 minutes. And we were like, Nope, it's gotta be 10 minutes. Like we've got to keep it to this, this, like, really simple, easy to use thing when I feel like, you know, as trainers, we want to throw everything in to something that yes. we're doing. Yes. My, my superpower. So what you're essentially asking me about was my superpower. Yeah. And, if, uh, and, if, and if people here don't know my superpower, I'm, I'm going to make it pretty clear. Uh, I have this incredible ability to make things much more complicated. Than <laughs> uh, I'm probably the best in the world at that. So um, yeah, that's a, that's exactly it. So you've been a really big help in, in helping me <laughs> not use um, my superpower. Well, I think that's really normal for trainers. I think it's really normal that we have all this information and we, we know like the things that, that clients should be doing or including, or, you know, we have that background. We have, you know, the experience and the science on our sides, but, um, at the end of the day, if it's going to be too much for people, how is that, you know, going to serve them to even yeah. like get started? So I think that's been a really like um, important part of your process developing these programs is figuring out how to make them clear and um, di really directed at meeting your your target audience where they're at. Yeah, um, it, it makes me think about this this um 
this way I like to think about movement, which is it's not what you do, it's how you do it. Um, and then the same thing with this, it's like, it's not necessarily the program, like 10 minutes or better or essential strength or whatever program is called. It's, it's how it's put together that actually is going to determine the, you know, consistency, success, like uh, all those different aspects of, of what you're trying to get out of it has to be really planned out. So you take stuff out that you don't absolutely need. Maybe you sneak it in here and there somewhere else. And so, so, but you know, you, you make it so that um, it's it's actionable and and simple, um, so that people don't have to think too much. Even the, even if you want them to think more, they don't always have the bandwidth to do so. So you got to find a way to meet them where they're at, bring them along on the journey with you, and then eventually you can get them to do what you want to do. What what you normally do or want to do if that's something that's still going to be useful and beneficial for them mm -hmm. um the, the you talked about like um a little bit touching on like program design like what you want people to learn you mm -hmm. i feel like i remember when you were playing out essential strength you um you kind of looked at like the whole program and like where you wanted somebody to go and learn in that program and you really ironed out that curriculum even if you didn't have all the like specific movements figured out but you inst instead of looking at movements you designed like an arc of learning mm -hmm. can you talk up a little bit about how you think about curriculum design because you have these two programs that you've worked on the curriculum for and you have a third program that is kind of in the works for this summer so can you talk a little bit about how you like so you have this pro idea that you want to do a program that's, you know, eight weeks long or 12 weeks long. Like, how do you um, create that curriculum for it? Great question, Rose. Thank you for asking. Um, <laughs> so from a curriculum standpoint, um, you know, to be honest, I, I had no idea what I was doing the first time I did it. it. So it's kind of like just put something out there, see what it looks like, get some feedback on it, make some adjustments and, and keep iterating. But to, to get more specific, um, you know, I'm, I like to, I typically like to work on a skill because I think it makes programming so much more fun and easy to do because there's a focus. Um, and uh, so with the, when it comes to curriculum, I, I like to think about it. Okay, so if it's a specific skill, squat, push up, pull up, front lever, back lever, whatever that is, if it's a specific skill, then you can just kind of like break it down into all the all the components and then work on building each of those in. Um, if it's not one specific skill, but maybe um, a series of, of movements, uh, maybe I'm rambling. Um, if it's a series of movements, that you want someone to be able to do in sequence or flow, then, then you do the same thing there. But I think there's also uh, a mental component to it in terms of how people are thinking about what they're doing and how they transition. And so each thing that I'm going to ask someone to do, I, I, I want to basically um, set them up for success so that by the end of a program, if I want them to do... Um, you know, X, Y, and Z, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna understand what the transitional pieces are and what the main points are. And I'm gonna have them uh, practice those things early on. So the curriculum is basically starting from the, the end, working backwards, seeing all the building blocks and then just putting them together to get to the end. So you really use reverse engineering when you're programming something like this? See, and this is another uh, example of helping me simplify something that I make over the complicated. Yes, I reverse engineer it. <laughs> that works. Um, so this is really, you also, the thing that I wanted to ask, I feel like you referenced when we first started talking, when you were talking about curriculum development, you, rec you had a couple of books that you talked to me about that you were looking yeah. at about you know, that helps you with curriculum design in terms of how people learn and things like that. Do you yeah. remember any of those off the top of your head? Um, 
Yeah, uh, one of them was Design for How People Learn, which is a really good book on just kind of like talks about different like different learning styles and um, how to effectively basically create curriculum that um, addresses the way people best learn. There's another book called How Humans Learn. Um, and, and there's another one. I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting this, this third book that, uh, that's also pretty good. Oh, micro learning. So the, uh, it, at the end of the day, a lot of it comes down to what I, what we were just talking about, where you just break things down into these small building blocks. And as long as it's really clear what the end goal is, then you can take those building blocks and understand how to order them so that like one thing allows you to understand something else better and so that's when you just you know figure out what goes first or second and third and stuff like that oh good resources um so i want to talk a little bit about the marketing for your programs too because i know that's been a big learning curve for you in this is is learning about email marketing and social media marketing and it's not your favorite thing to do um <laughs> So maybe you could talk a little bit about how that process has been, because um, in the beginning you were pretty. Yeah, yeah. Um, where to begin? Uh, so when it comes to marketing, I've I've had, you know, I think many people have pretty polarizing thoughts about marketing, um, and one of the first things that helped me look at marketing in a different light was, uh, I believe, uh, this book by Seth Godin called This is Marketing, um, which helped me realize that maybe marketing isn't a bad thing. It's just the way that I have seen it mm -hmm. is not the way I appreciate it. Uh, I think one thing he says in the book is, if it feels like marketing, it's probably not very good. But like mm -hmm. really good marketing feels it doesn't feel pushy. It just is like, cool. Like there's this thing you probably, you probably want this thing and then you get it. And I think that's, so for me, from a, from a, you know, marketing perspective, I never want to seem pushy. Uh, I want people to want to do a program. I want people to want to do this or that. Uh, I don't want to like make it so that they keep getting emails or or something that's like, and the only way that I, you're going to get out of my email list is if you purchase this program right now. Um, not like I could actually do that, but you know, like I, I don't, I don't want to be somewhere where I'm not wanted. And so um, that's always been my thing is like, how do I know that someone wants me here? How do I know that what I'm providing is, is something that this person actually wants and needs right now? Um, and so when it comes to marketing something that you've helped me a lot with is if i i can i can i can put information out there i can put myself out there and if someone wants that information they will they will go and gather it if they don't want the information they will delete it from their email inbox or they will scroll past it on instagram or they will do whatever um and you know the nice thing about those is you can't really take it i can't take it personally because i don't see them deleting my email or scrolling past. Right. I might see the unsubscribed, but that's okay. I understand that too. Um, so yeah, it's, it, I think a lot of it has to do with mindset and the way you look at it and your perspective. So now I see it more like that. Now I see it more like, you know, it, it's my community contribution. It's something I'm trying to just share with people. And if the sharing is useful to you, great. You're going to like it. And then you might come back for more. If it's not useful to you, you may forget I exist and that's fine too. Um, so that's where I am with marketing. And now I say this, but then, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm supposed, I was supposed to post something, I think yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm supposed to post something today. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna do it. And I'm gonna remember what I just said. I'm just, <laughs> trying to contribute to the community in the best way that I know how. That's great. Keep repeating that. There you go. Um, do you have any tips or tricks for how to get over the, I don't know what to post, so I just don't post 
thing? Um, message Rose for ideas. <laughs> JK, JK. Um, uh, well, I, I think it's similar to programming. Like, and this is, again, so this is for me. When there's a specific skill that someone wants to work on or that I want someone to get better at, it, it's so much easier than be like, oh, well, I know what, I know what activities or movements or exercises need to go into this program. Um, if I, so for me, oftentimes, like, I, I, if you know me, I can go many different directions in from any conversation. And so uh, my, my question is like, well, where do I start? Oh, sorry, that was, uh, let me just do that. Do not disturb, my bad. All good. Can you see me? Okay. Can see you. Where am I? I've, I lost my train of thought real quick. Uh, for when you can go in many different directions uh, okay. for different things and how do you narrow it down to post something and you know not to get yeah. like paralysis from overwhelm. Yeah, also you're gonna, Cut that part right. You're just going to cut, cut. Sure. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, so just like with programming, having a skill that you're, that you're working on makes it easier to figure out what to do. And I think when it comes to like posting, having something specific to post about that you want to share, it can be a product or a service that you're trying to promote. Sure, but it doesn't always have to be, and it, it shouldn't necessarily be. But let's say like. I guess one way of thinking about it is if you do have something that you want to um, promote at some point, cool. Put that like a month down the road and think about all the different reasons why you think this product is useful or, or why it came to mind in the first place. And then all those reasons could be their own blog posts um, or they could just be short little snippets that you then put into um, you know, Instagram, LinkedIn, whatever it is, posts, um, and then you go from there. So building blocks, like all the different reasons. Um, and I'm sure if you put on some nice music, close off the rest of the world for 30 minutes, you can come up with probably like 10 different things to think of and talk about. And then it's just a matter of, you know, closing your eyes and hitting, you know, post, which is what I do every time. You have grown so much with your social media and your marketing in general. Thank you. But I imagine I have so much more growing to do. <laughs> we all do. We like all Jack do. climbing the beanstalk. I'm not quite at the, at the city in the clouds yet. <laughs> um, the other question I have for you is, you know, you're a gym owner. You have a business that you run you have a wife and two young kids plus a commute sometimes um how do you find time to do this all it's a great question rose um i mostly well, am asking you this because i feel that like a lot of trainers do want to build something out but it's really hard to find that time to like carve out to do something that one is like extra and two really hard so yeah. curious to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah. Um, honestly, a lot of it's piecemeal. Like it, it's not too dissimilar from 10 minutes to better from the standpoint of like, I might have 10 minutes to think through some ideas here or there, or you you know, I'll have 45 minutes between this and that. And so I'll like, just put on some music and just think and write some ideas and, or maybe I need to go on a walk, like, so a lot, you know, a lot of things are just simply ideas, and then everything that that, that exists in the world that was man-made began in the exact same place in the mind of a human. And so you just find the time to like be able to think through things, and then I think the next piece is being able to like talk to someone about it um, and brainstorm it and have them tell you that your idea is probably not great or great or like give you a different perspective to start to consider so i like first you need time for all these things and then you also need like a network and resources um i'm i'm lucky that i have the network to be able to like reach out to people if i have an idea that's in my head and i can just you know 
go off and talk about it. And then, you know, I get pretty, pretty honest uh, feedback from people being like, hmm, okay, yeah. get, come back to me when you've thought through that a little bit more um, or stuff like that. Um, and then when I, from a time perspective, like if you're, if you're seeing, so if you're seeing clients all the time, it's really hard to be in the brain space of creativity, right? Like <laughs> there's something that a few different people and people I follow have, have brought up, which is the difference between working time and creative time and, and, or, you know, making, uh, I think another term for it is making time. So like commit to making time, making, making time. Um, and now that might not be easy to do. So sometimes like I might have an idea pop into my head. I'll write down a quick note on my phone because maybe I'm making dinner for the family or doing something else where I can't necessarily like delve deep into it. And then after I help get the kids to bed, it's, you know, whatever time it is and I'm tired and then I do some dishes and then I'm like, cool, I'm going to go to bed. And I'm like, I gotta, gotta just think through this thing. And you can just set it. It could be 10 minutes, 15 minutes. It could be 20, 30 minutes. Find something that gets you into that mode of being able to think and focus. And, you know, for me, it's some nice lo-fi beats. Um, and you just, you just, you know, go with it. And then at a certain point, you're going to flow. And, and it might be that, you know, you sacrifice an hour of sleep every night for a week. Don't do it all the time because sleep is very important. But like it has to come from somewhere. And if it doesn't come from somewhere in the day, maybe you wake up 30 minutes early or maybe you go to bed a little bit later. Um, you, there's, if it matters, you will make the time somehow, some way. I feel like, also, um, oh yes, go ahead. Also, um, ask friends. So if you have friends or family, if you like, so if you have kids and like this, what I'm saying is, crazy and ridiculous cool ask a family member or a friend for some help you know whether it's kids animals pets whatever it is like there's there's always a way um and i think leaning on those who care about you is is the thing we probably don't do enough so keep that for in sure. mind i was just going to say that i feel like i've gotten video messages from you talking out some of your stuff while you're walking your youngest in a stroller to go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, the idea is you can't, you can't predict or control when they come to your mind. So you just like need to find a way to get them out. Uh, and the verbalization of the idea helps you think about it as well. Right. Um, and then again, so now that it's out there, a, you're not going to forget it because you, you know, video recorded it or did something. Um, so you can always check back on it later. Um, and B, now you've been able to process it a little bit more. Yeah, I know other trainers who have done just voice recordings when they're like trying to plan out something because it's they can't get the time to sit down and just type it all. So they just, when they're doing something else, just turn on like voice memo recorder and just talk it out. Because mm -hmm. you're right, I think there is something to verbalizing it either yeah. you know just to themselves or to somebody else that will get it out and make it feel a little bit more reachable. Yeah. So yeah, that's a good point. I think even um, going one step further, if you are like, if you have someone trying to trying to get you to do more talking head videos, um, probably <laughs> it's 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 a good idea to do like a video recording of yourself and just like get used to seeing yourself and seeing yourself talk and and all that stuff so that again, even if it's just an idea, just so it's not like the first time you see yourself on, on screen for, you know, in a month or two, you're like, oh, geez, I got to fix that. And do that. you just more get more comfortable in your own skin. And you're like, cool, cool. This is good. Let me like, you can focus on the content as opposed to like how things look, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. I feel like, I feel like Marco Polo is very useful for you in that regard. Love me some MP. <laughs> So um, I want to finish with just you telling us a little bit more about the third program that you're going to be launching maybe later this summer. Oh, didn't know we were going to be talking about that. Um, G squared. I like the name. Um, you might be thinking, what is this G squared? 
Well, that's good because you never heard it before. Um, it's basically my attempt to bring kettlebells to more people. Um, kettlebells and, well, it's kind of like a, a mixture of kettlebells and body weight. So we'll call it a, a GMB and kettlebells. How about that? Um, and so the, the plan is that you, you, a person, we'll say you, Rose, you could go on and you could check out a couple of different programs and, and based upon whether you're trying to get better at a specific skill, let's say you've, you've done swings in the past, but yeah, this didn't feel great. So in, in person, see, now I'm going to go off on a, on a tangent in person. Um, <laughs> when, when people would come to me and say like, Oh, you know, when I swing kettlebells, my back hurts. I'm like, okay. I'm a, I'm a massive fan of kettlebells. And I believe that if, if your back hurts, it's not because the kettlebell is bad because the kettlebell doesn't care about you one way or another. It's, it doesn't, it's not alive. Uh, it's simply a matter of how we're doing it. So again, not what we're doing, but how we're doing. It. So, you know, I've been able to successfully, every single person who's come to me saying kettlebells hurt their back. We figured out what's going on. It's some movement thing that's super subtle off, often it's super subtle and they can now swing deadlift, do all these things in their back shoes in the back. Is good. So we use that as our example. So my goal is that someone wouldn't have to come to me specifically or personally to, to be able to swing a kettlebell comfortably and develop speed, strength, power, whatever it is they're trying to develop with the use of the swing. So the plan is that you'd, you know, sign up for a swing program and it's all pre-recorded. And in that swing program, it basically, there's building blocks. You, you do session one and you follow through each session until you get to the last session. And in theory, by the end of that last session, you should be comfortable. You have more agency with picking up a kettlebell with two hands, of course, uh, and doing a swing or multiple swings with it. Um, and, you know, developing certain skills or sorry, um, certain physiological attributes. I'm getting nerdy um, with the kettlebell swing. So now you just added to the arsenal of things that you can use. So that's one example, but then you can think about other kettlebell movements, throw that in there and, 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 and the, there can be a program for most things. Right on. And so this is going to be kind of your mid tier offer, right? Like 10 minutes to better is your kind of like entry point for people. And then essential strength is your high ticket program and G squared is going to be somewhere in that, in the mid range, right? For people yeah. Who so maybe already have a, you know, somewhat of a practice going, they've got some habits built and they're ready to do more skill work. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely going to be skill work specific. Um, yeah, definitely more mid range. Cool. All right. Well, we'll be on the lookout for that. And can you tell people what your Instagram handle is so they can go check out you're talking head videos. Oh, yes. All those talking head videos. Uh, at CC Gaines. G-A-I-N-E-S is how you spell my last name. CC Gaines. Awesome. Great. Um, and they can get through to all your other offers from your um, Instagram profile, right? You have everything linked there. Yeah, I have a link tree in there. So that has everything's in there, I believe. Yeah. Cool. And if people have questions, they can always comment and ask you, you are usually more than happy to, uh, you know, give some uh, info, share some tips and strategies or give feedback or whatever. So oh, cool yeah. to reach out to you. I absolutely love talking shop. You know, if someone's trying to get better, I'm all, I'm all on board. Let's get better together. So yeah, if you have questions, I'm happy to talk with you and I'll ask you a bunch of questions too. And we're all going to leave the conversation a little bit better. Awesome. Thank you so much for uh, chatting today. I um, always enjoy talking with you. You're one of my favorite people to hang out with. So sure. maybe we'll, uh, we'll catch up and do this again in another six months and we can hear more about how G squared launch went and where you're at yeah, then. Yeah. It sounds great. I look forward to it. All right. Thanks Rose. Bye.